and this is an awesome turnout. Uh, thank you all for being here. We're really lucky to have such a terrific speaker to end the semester. Um, I think most of us in here already know the speaker, but I'm going to give a formal introduction um, about a number of things which might be familiar to you, but uh, maybe some things will be new too. So let me just say that uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Mo Banerjee, who's in our Department of History here at UW-Madison. And um, Mo came here in 2019 and from the get-go has been making significant contributions in the South Asian Studies community here on campus. He's a critical researcher, an excellent colleague, and an award-winning teacher, which is something I think we're going to really get some insights into today, and I'll come back to that in just a second. First, let me just say a few things about our research, uh, which tackle historical developments and entanglements in religion and politics in India, the, his the history of gender, hunger, and food politics, and the history of borders and immigration in South Asia. And her first book, titled The, Di the Disinherited, Christianity and Conversion in Colonial India, 1813 to 1907, is forthcoming with Harvard University Press. And just as a, a, an aside, I and I know another person, one other person in here, were lucky enough to be able to read an early draft of this, this manuscript in a seminar that focused on it in the Center for Humanities. And it was very clear then that this is going to be a very significant book, make a sizable impact in the history, the modern history of religion in India and a bunch of other fields. So keep your eyes open for that publication. Uh, it's very interdisciplinary and important, important work. But impressively, I've also come to learn that she's got a second book in the works and under contract. And something that really is uh, tremendous and shows the productivity of Professor Banerjee. Uh, this is going to be an intellectual history of the life and times of the pioneering Indian social reformer Raja Ramohan Roy. So that's something I look forward to learning more about too. But today, in addition to learning from Mo, we're going to be seeing, uh, we're going to get some insights into why she's such an exceptional teacher. Something that earned her the Dorothy and Sin Nung Yao Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching from the History Department last year. This year, okay. Uh, so in a talk titled Doing Nonviolence, an Experiment in Student-Led Learning and Research Initiatives, Mo will be walking us through big questions about a project she's been leading here on campus about nonviolence. So help us understand what nonviolence is, why it's important, where the idea came from, its relation to violence, and what it's been used for, by whom, and in which context. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Banerjee to speak today. Thank you. You've given me confidence and back in myself so that was sorely needed, so thank you very much. I am, as always, absolutely delighted to be back at the Center for South Asia, which has been such an important part of my life, my research, my teaching, and my friendships in, in, you know, in UW-Madison since I've been here. It has helped me get through a pandemic, it has helped me navigate very difficult first three years as an assistant professor on the tenure track, my gratitude knows no bounds. And I also, I see so many friendly faces around this room. I, today morning I woke up and I was like, there might be three people. And I'd be very happy we can just have a talk and I can just go home. Maybe there will be samosas. The samosas are lacking, but the friends are <laughs> So I'm just so happy that all of us you know, could be here to, to, uh, today. That said, um, I'm, I'm a little unwell, so this talk might not be as fiery and passionate sort of you know, raging through this room as I usually would have done. So please forgive me as I sit like a queen and try and make sense of something that has been very, very important over the last few years or so. So <clears throat> as the pandemic was going on and as I was figuring out what I wanted to teach to my students here at UW Madison, I started th thinking through options of what about South Asia undergraduate students might like to know more? And this has been a challenge for me, as I think it is a challenge for anyone teaching South Asia, Southeast Asia for that matter, or anything that is in the rest of the world. You know, there is the West and then there is the rest of the world. And for any of us who teach anything in the rest of the world, it is always a challenge to figure out what might be the hook, the entryway into our subject for students who sometimes 
because of lack of exposure, we know very little about them. And one of the things that came to my mind was Mahatma Gandhi. I've seen so many of my students talk about him, misspell his name. It's usually spelled G-H-A-N-T-I, and whenever I see that, something in me just sort of shows up and dies. <laughs> but, uh, you know, be the change you see in the world, which, by the way, I have not found in the 100 published volumes of Gandhi, you know, that are, that are all, all the time. So I don't know where that came from. But he might have said it. He, he said very interesting things all the time. And my idea was, could I teach a course that would lead my students into South Asia through this cycle? <coughs> And for a scholar like me who works on marginalized lives, who works on erased lives, this is something of a paradox. I don't want to talk about the most well-known South Asian of all time, but maybe through him we could learn something about South Asia that would be interesting to my students. Maybe he was the approach way, the get, 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 okay. Now my English is leaving me, the gateway. So, what about Gandhi? Of course, nonviolence is the first thing that comes to mind. And when people talk about Gandhi, that is the thing they say, nonviolence, Gandhi, civil resistance. I thought, why not talk about an intellectual history of that idea of nonviolence? What does it mean? It is one of those words which essentially is a blank slate. You would write anything about it and make it work in, a, you know, in every different context that you put to use, right? And that is how I started figuring out this seminar course, if you will. My first iteration of it was taught as a capstone for seniors, History 600. And I figured out that this was something students really, really liked doing. That particular semester was spent so well that the History Department very kindly invited me to present to our board of visitors who are history department alums who take a very keen interest in helping us do more historical research. You know, provide us the funds to do very interesting things in the history department, provide us funds to support our students and our projects. And the idea was that some kind of innovative, innovative te you know, teaching that I was doing that needed to be presented to them. And so this is the middle of the pandemic. I have been teaching online. It has gone as it has gone, and I was very happy with it because it was a test project. And then I sit in front of the board of visitors, and I give them a rundown of what I'm trying to do with this project, what my students bring to this project, and ultimately, what was the efficacy, or you know, what was the reason? Why would we even talk about nonviolence, which can sometimes also be seen as somewhat dated? In, in the U.S., in, in you know, in the scholarship that has emerged, you know, out of the civil uh, civil rights movement, there are sometimes opinions that say nonviolence is not something that is applicable in a situation where those who would respond to a nonviolent action are so heavily militarized and prone to reacting with violence. So, what was the what was the use of teaching something like this? And once I gave that presentation. I have very rarely had such attentive, you know, listeners, and then there were there was a barrage of questions. And they were very, very, you know, pointed questions. They were very, uh, you know, there were questions that made me think a lot. And after that question and answer session, I think ran over the allotted time. It went on for like 15 minutes, whereas I had been given five minutes to like sort of talk and five minutes for any Q and A. That was, you know, the, the chair of the board of visitors um, just just looked at me and said, what can we do to help you make this into something that is going to go back to the UW Madison community and the Wisconsin community? And I was completely stunned because I had no idea that that question was coming to me. Um, so I said, how about I create a digital database? And how about, I, you know, our undergraduate students, you know, come in and do the research? And that way, you know, in keeping with the Wisconsin idea, we are giving back to the community. But our students also learn how to do hands-on research in archives. They learn to do research in areas of the world that are not the U.S. They get a, you know, a platform where they can showcase their research and writing. That is going to be helpful. And then this, 
asking how much money do you want? <laughs> None of these questions I had even thought to prepare for. And I said, maybe $5,000 if it is not too much. <laughs> and they were like, oh yes, absolutely, take it. <laughs> I think this was serendipity in a way because all of that was on the fly. I should apologize to the Board of Visitors. It might have seemed as something that I had prepared and come prepared to answer, but it was all on the fly. But once I had the money, I had to make that big idea. And the first thing was essentially figuring out how to pay my students, because I made it very, very clear to Christina Mata, who is undergraduate advisor in the history department, and who was working with me, who is the most astonishing human being ever, if you ask her for something, it's going to happen. You know, Sometimes I forget that I ask her for things, and then six months later, she'll come back to me and be like, oh, you said that we need to do this. It has been done. It's almost magic. Um, I told Christina, I do not want to have students work for a project where I'm not paying them. That goes against the very idea of non-violence. I think unpaid internships are a form of violence against undergrads or against anyone who have to do it. And she was like, oh yeah, we'll be them. We'll be them on an early basis. Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. And then we started recruiting students. Most of them for the very first group that I had and the group that has now graduated came from that um, 600 that I had taught. And in the spring when I taught a faith, which is a first year interest group, based on the same, uh, you know, based on the same subject, but of course, you know, essentially tailored to appeal to students who were just coming in from high school. It was, it, you know, it started, you know, making more sense. I have had, I have had students who have now work for me for about two years, and it has already gone dark. But uh, we can, we can take a look at the look at the website as we get through. Why am I talking about this? I think there is a kind of understanding that. Teachers, just some of us are just very good teachers, and some of us are competent ones, and we just sort of manage to perform well enough that our students don't know how terribly agonized we are for every single class that we go in to take. Um, I, I feel like I'm sort of letting out like weird arcane secrets of the profession, but for at least the first four you know weeks of teaching any class, even now. I've been teaching since I was 21 in some way or the other. It's like half my life now. I still, my hands still shake before I get into teaching. I have to hide them under the lectern. Well, I didn't do it today, but that's okay. Uh, essentially, what this project has done for me is help me become a better teacher. It has allowed me to sort of step outside what I thought nonviolence was and the way in which I talk nonviolence. And it has allowed me, in a way, to get a much wider sense of how we think about civil resistance in this world right now, the world that we live in, where there is a huge amount of violence constantly that we see in front of our eyes because of media, where we are almost desensitized to these petty cruelties and the bigger ones because there is so much hate and violence and misinformation and vituperation, I think in some ways it was restorative to me ethically, politically, and gave me back some hope and sort of nurtured the ethic out of which I teach. None of this would have been possible without any of my undergraduate students. Again, students meet the teacher, I think. We don't, some of this, there is this idea that teachers are great mentors and we shape our students' futures. I think it's the other way around. I think anytime we come across a good student, a great student, an amazing student, the answers change into a better version of who we can be. And that, that happened to me, I think, in a very, very significant and meaningful way as I was working through this project. Let me just come back a little bit to the idea of non-violence itself. If I were, you know, as I do to all my students, just, just catch them out, if I were to ask any of you, what do you mean by non-violence? There are no wrong answers. 
just just what do you what do you think of when you when, when I say <coughs> I think of it as like almost like a it is like a resistance in a way, but it's like but it's I wanna like it's nonviolent. But um it's like an absence of or no, it's not an absence. I feel like it's a it's like a deliberate resistance and maybe to what? That's but that's what first thing. Fantastic answer. What are the three kinds of responses that we have? Once we are you know, faced with violence and violence, what do we do? Any kind of violence, physical, mental, emotional. What are the three responses human beings usually have when faced with violence? We uh, we can hit back, we can stand, or run away. The running away or the hitting back are the usually you know the ones that we are conditioned to do. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of discipline. And that attitude, that learned discipline, is the goal of nonviolence. It's very unnatural. It's not a natural response from a human being. It's not the flight or the fight, fight response. It is a freeze response, but it is something that is a learned freeze response. It is something that we do only when we think about ourselves in relation to violence, and we tell ourselves that no matter what happens, we are not going to answer violence in the way in which it is inflicted upon us. It can be on a personal level, it can be on a mass level, which is what Gandhi is known for, but it requires a kind of courage and it requires a kind of discipline that is very, very difficult to achieve. Which is why when people say, well, nonviolence is in some ways passive, it is not. If someone is going to harm you, just to stand there is very, very difficult to do. And it requires practice, it requires self-control every single moment, in every single day. What are the limits of nonviolence? What do we, you know, what do we consider as nonviolence in our lives? How far are we able to push it personally and politically? If you are crossing during during you know the 15 minutes that you have to get from one class to another, someone bumps into you very hard. What is your reaction? Or you have woken up on the wrong side of the bed and you get out and you're very grumpy through the day, which happens to the best of us. Have you heard someone sleeping? Or you know, I don't even know. Have you eaten meat today or fish? Hunting. What is the limit at which you think of non-harm to the rest of the world? Are you Mahatma Gandhi and you have inspired an entire nation and within 15 years brought in a mass component to an anti-colonial movement and at the same time in your personal life have you been very coercive to the women who surround you? At what point does nonviolence essentially end? How far can you take it? If you go on a fast, if you go on a hunger strike, or if you commit an act of self immolation is that nonviolent? Is that nonviolent resistance if you're harming yourself in some way? What is your duty to the world, but then what is your duty to yourself? It is not quite as simple as it seems when we start discussing these issues. Unfortunately, somehow, it seems as if the discourse around it, even in the civil rights movement, even in the Indian context, even in South Africa, that is the name of the class, Gandhi, King, Mandela, non-violence in the world, who are we leaving out when we talk about these things? Yes, all of these are great men. Who help them be great? Nehru, for example, once said, it takes a lot of effort and money to keep Babu, that is not Gandhi in poverty. <laughs> so who is propelling it behind the scenes? 
are there people who have gone before and created a path for you to carry out nonviolence? Are you creating a path that is significant enough that others can follow? How has it changed in the late 20th and early 21st centuries? Do we still, we still need a figure like Gandhi or Kane or Mandela because of social media? Now, is it more diffuse? What, is, what can happen? What is the limit at which nonviolence fades? This is one of the questions that uh, Charles Cohen, who is an emeritus professor in the history department, asked me, and I still don't know the answer to it. I keep thinking about it. What is the moment at which nonviolent resistance can essentially just fall apart? It is not possible to practice it. Of course, when your opponent is so singularly without any conscience or political ethic, that for them, this does not really matter. It is Mahatma Gandhi's chosen successor who does not stop Poti Suramadu's fast to death that he undertakes in the 1950s to stop the linguistic reorganization of states. Again, what do we do with this idea? Should we even think about it in this current world? Why should I give my very young students a kind of ethics of resistance to follow when I know that I'm actually putting them in harm's way when they go ahead and do this. What is my culpability as a professor in you know, stoking this sort of ideals in very, very idealistic people because the classes I teach, in a way they are self-selecting. There are certain kinds of people who come and take my classes. There are certain kinds of people who come and work for the project. I have been driven with doubt about this project. My teaching has taken on more romance. My knowledge of civil resistance in the world and who performed these acts of civil resistance, the idea of what constitutes success in nonviolent movements, all of these things have changed. All I can say is I know far less and I have far, you know, far less certitude about the world right now than I did when I began this class. But I also know that I, there is something here that helps me go, go ahead. There is something here that rejuvenates me as a teacher and as, as, as you know, someone who works with pedagogy as I go ahead with this project. The third thing, what do my students do? I keep saying they do wonderful work. What does it take to make a project like this run? Well, it takes dedicated researchers. It takes people who have a sense of what they want to put out into the world, what kind of areas of the world they want to do their research on, how they want to do that research. Every year as we begin, at least twice a year again, every semester I should say, in the fall and in the spring, we have a meeting, usually in the rat scalar, which I feed them and they give me amazing ideas. It's very <coughs> happy relationship on both sides, let's just put it that way. We figure out what it is that we want to do. We know first and foremost that we have to put out information in the world in two ways. One, that it's easily accessible to those who are not academics. I feel like academics, and I, I'm, I'm the greatest culprit here, so I'm not even talking about everybody in the room. You know, someone, one, my, my book editor actually told me, oh, you write like a Victorian grandmother. <laughs> you start at the top of the page, end at the beginning, you know, you know, the end of the page, and then there are so many clauses I can't make sense of it, right? We shouldn't write like that. It hurts me to say this, but we shouldn't write like that. We should write in a way that our information is easily accessible by people who are very intelligent, but don't speak the way we do, right? It could be my mother, it could be my student's grandmother, you know, it could be the neighbor who wants to know a little bit more about Gandhi or about Mandela or about Coretta Scott King. We should provide information in a way that is easily accessible. That idea of the IP tower, I think, needs to be essentially sort of dismantled at this very basic level. The second is where we are getting the information. Every single year as I begin to teach this class and as I begin to talk to my interns, at least one person will be, you know, will very innocently, you know, tell me, well, Tucker Carlson says, at which point my heart kind of sings again. And I have to say, well, you know, he might not be the best source of information for you. 
And the next question is, what is the best source of information? What do you mean? Information is information. And I have to tell them, well, because this is a history class, because this is a project that emerges out of a historian's interest, we have to know about what sources of, you know, what are the sources that we can trust. And that makes me go to the archives that we have. That helps me get them to books that I want them to read. And as, you know, it takes a village. So Todd Nichols and Anne Mellon, for example, has been absolutely wonderful. We have this, you know, study guide for my classes and for this project that my students have to learn. My friend Casey Lukini Butcher, who uh, essentially put up a sifting and reckoning exhibition, which is brilliant. Please go and see it before the 23rd of December when it closes. Comes in and talks to my students about doing public facing history. I recently started talking to Troy Reeves, who does oral history at University of Madison, has essentially written the protocol on how to do oral history at Italy from the next iteration of this project, which is this coming spring. My students will be uh, required, those who work on the project, to go take a workshop with Troy about doing this sort of oral, you know, oral interviews and essentially using them in historical sources. So again, I'm teaching them how to do history, where to look for it. Very often, some of them will come to me. Gabe Sanders is one of my undergraduate students. And he came and said, I want to work in Latin America, but there are no English sources. What shall I do? And I said, well, Gabe, you know how to learn, you know, how to speak about Spanish, and you know how to read Spanish. Why don't you figure out what the Spanish sources are? Why don't you do your own translations? And then we'll run it by someone who has a better understanding of, of academic Spanish, if you need. And then we'll put that translation on the website as well. And he's done so much work on Latin American figures that even I didn't know. Again, a new horizon, horizon movement. Finally, you know, doing nonviolence, which is the which is the title of this of this talk that I was supposed to give. How do we do nonviolence in this way? So my first in my my, my you know in my first life, if you will, that sounds very much like like a nun. Who, anyway, um, <laughs> my first love. Let's put it that that's what world we know probably. My first undergraduate and MA degrees were in English literature, and Milton was one of my favorite poets. And one of his, uh, you know, very characteristically morbid and gloomy poems. So when I consider how my light is spent, which he wrote when he was exactly my age, 38, and his eyesight was getting worse and worse, and he was already at that point, you know, the foreign secretary for Cromwell in the English interregnum, and he was trying to figure out what to do with his life, you know, because he was writing hundreds of letters every day and then looking at correspondence and diplomatic notes and, and white papers, and he was like, what should I do with my life if my eyesight is gone? And also, he's already writing, he's already begun Paradise Lost. There is the last line of that poem which says, they also, they also serve who only stand and wait. Many, many people do many, many things, very active. Nonviolence is in some ways standing and waiting, preparing for that moment of action to come. Nonviolence and success in nonviolence, again, is also a question of waiting. It takes a much longer time than a violent revolution would take. It takes a much longer time than an election would take. When you go and do nonviolence, you need patience. You need to stand and wait. When you learn how to do nonviolence, and someone comes to me and says, I want to write about this. I want to write about you know, Native American schools being set up in Wisconsin. I tell them, you have to go back and see how long it took for that to you know, actually happen. It cannot happen immediately. And I also tell them, you cannot write an article from two newspaper reports that you find on Google search. You have to actually go back to the archives. Half the boxes will be empty. Some of them might be more eaten, but that's more an Indian problem than, than an American one. You have to have patience to search through the evidence to tell a compelling story. You have to stand and wait. That, I think, in the project, in the hands-on way in which we are doing this, is learning how to have that patience and learning how to slowly sift through material 
so that you can produce something that is enduring. Who are the people who are doing this? Not a 38-year-old, very, very tired woman. 18 or 19-year-old people who have a lot of enthusiasm and energy. And perhaps the patience is a little lacking. So it takes a lot of exercise on their part to make this happen. So that is what I mean by doing what happens. Someone has to remember things. Someone has to write down things. Someone has to use that memory and that knowledge to do greater things in the future. All of these things are things that historians do. All of these things are required when you need something like nonviolence to succeed, when you need to answer the overwhelming violence in the world with an alternative. Thank you. are so much better at it, as they say. This entire project has come together in the last year and a half. Please remember that the last, until the last year, the summer of 2021, at least until the end of the fall semester, library and archive access was pretty limited. We were slowly coming out of the pandemic. My students had a very difficult time actually figuring out all of these other I am also very, very thankful that the undergraduates of this generation are so much technically better than I am. So I had Alec after first, and now I have someone called Chloe Ford, who essentially just made this happen, this beautiful website happen. What have you been working on? If you want to know anything at all about nonviolence, just go to our resources page. We have books, we have films, we have documentaries, they even have linkages to a database where you can learn the tactics of doing nonviolence. What else do we have? And for this I have to thank my student Nadia Hayasi. You want to sing along? <laughs> You want to go on a jog in the morning and it's freezing, freezing cold, there, there you go. You just, you just turn that on. Every month we have a newsletter, so if you sign up, we can give you, you know, some sense of what it is that we are doing with this project, what our students are doing, what kind of work have they done, just to give you an example. I'm just going to go to Latin America because that is most all of this is done by Gabe. And as you can see, this is an undergraduate school. This is almost on par with some of the graduate students that I have taught here. Which again, one of them is in the room. So he, for example, worked for me this summer and produced some absolutely amazing research. As you can see, and all of these are very, very well researched very well sourced and very easily written in easy language so that you can you know, essentially understand what these efforts are about, what these pro uh, protests are about, even if you don't know too much about the history. And ultimately, we also have this, we are you know, in tune with the changing terms. So if you give us a follow, we are going to be very happy. We have only 62 people following us. So please, please give us a follow. I'm always also on the lookout for more people to bring in onto the dark side, you know. Um, if any of you want to work for the project, as I said, I pay my students. I will not make you work without pay. Please write to me, send me your CV and a writing sample. I just learned from the history department and from Christina that we have raised the hourly pay of our students to $17 an hour, which is substantial. I am thinking of figuring out a way to have uh, graduate students get up to $2,000 in the summer as a grant if they can produce a significant research article or paper to do with nonviolence or with civil resistance. The history department already has two prizes 
uh, for papers written on a topic related to nonviolence or to civil resistance. We are trying very, very hard to make this something that is worthwhile, something that, in a practical sense, anyone who works for me can put on a CV and be proud about, and something that helps them be both better human beings. I would, I would like to, you know, think that way, or maybe they're already such good human beings that they do the project, and also people who are very good researchers. And you know, you don't need to be, you don't need to go into academia to have those skills actually, you know, be helpful. Any job you get to, you're going to have to write, you know, write about projects, you're going to have to do research, you're going to have to read through law briefs, for example. Anything that you do, that research skill, that writing skill is going to come in handy. So please, if any of you want to work for me, let me know. I will be so happy to take you in. Um, any questions? I'm very willing to answer questions. Do you have any questions?